Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you all to our virtual launch event for Joe Burns's new book, Class Struggle Unionism. If you haven't already, you can order a copy of Class Struggle Unionism directly from haymarketbooks.org. You can get it for 30% off, and you will also get a free ebook if you order it directly from our website. We are delighted tonight to have both Joe Burns and Barbara, Mandalo Barbara Mandaloni here with us tonight to talk about what exactly class struggle unionism is and to share their ideas about how we can continue to build a more radical militant labor movement in the struggles today. So before we get started, I want to take a moment to introduce our two speakers and then I will turn it over to Barbara and Joe who will take things from there. So Joe Burns is a veteran union negotiator and labor lawyer with over 25 years of experience negotiating labor agreements. He is currently the director of collective bargaining for the Association of Flight Attendants, CWA. He graduated from the New York University School of Law and prior to law school, he worked in a public sector hospital and was president of his AFSCME local. He is the author of Class Struggle Unionism, Strike Back and Reviving the Strike. Barbara Mandaloni is a staff organizer and writer at Labor Notes. Shout out to Labor Notes. Prior to coming to Labor Notes, she was the president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, where she was elected out of a left caucus, Educators for Democratic Union. She remains very active in the caucus and in the United Caucus of Rank and File Educators. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Barbara to start the event. Great, thanks very much, Dana. Uh, hi, Joe, and welcome to everybody who's uh, here tonight. Really excited to be here and have this conversation uh, with Joe about his book, about the ideas in it. Uh, what we're going to do is Joe and I are going to talk for about uh, 35, 45 minutes. I have some questions for him about the book. Uh, as you are, have questions, please put them in the chat and uh Dana will send them along to me and Joe, uh, and we'll take those questions up uh, at some point. We're going to be online for about uh, 90 minutes talking. So looking forward to hearing from Joe, uh, to exploring these ideas, and to then hearing from you all as well with the questions that you have to make. Uh, so with that, Joe, I'm going to start with a really big question, uh, and then we'll dig down uh, a little bit deeper. Uh, but title of your book is Class Struggle Unionism. It's a phrase that I know I use a lot, that not enough people use, uh, but that others use. Um, but tell us, like, what does it actually mean? Uh, what, what do you mean when you say class struggle unionism? Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, class struggle unionism uh, for the first uh, you know, 100 years of trade unionism up until the 1980s was really the main competitor to bureaucratic business unionism. And class struggle unionism really begins with a, you know, fairly simple proposition. And what it does is it's based on an analysis of the of the work transaction that, you know, millions and millions of workers engage in work every day. Um, they get hired by an employer. Um, if not this employer, then another employer. Everyone's forced to work to survive. And when they go to work, um, the employer hire, hires them for the very reason that by their work, um, they produce value for the employer. So whether you're a truck driver, a nurse, a uh, auto worker, a barista, an Amazon worker, um, during your work shift, um, you perform, uh, you know, actions and provo provide services or makes goods. And as a result of that, uh, whatever you do, uh, the inputs of the employer are made more valuable by your, by your work. And the classical unionism comes into it uh, because um, even though you produce a certain amount of value during your shift, you're paid a fraction of that. And when you look at that transaction happening in, in workplace after workplace around the country and around the globe, um, what happens is the employers uh, take part of the value that you have produced and they pocket it for themselves. Now they call it profit, class struggle unionists traditionally have called it theft. 
um, they have viewed it that this is a, a, you know, an illegitimate system where a small class of people can control most of the wealth in society. And really from that sort of analysis of the employment transaction, um, you know, we view it because of that. That's why we have billionaires. That's why we have a class of people with unimaginable wealth. And from that simple proposition kind of flows everything in the book and in class struggle unionism, it leads to a, a, a form of unionism, which is based on ideas such as, you know, you know that we're in conflict with employers and views us as, uh, you know, the workplace transaction as being sort of the very key to unionism and a lot of other ideas, not, not least of which is the idea that we're fighting as a class and not just in individual battles. Okay. Yeah, I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, as you were introducing that, you mentioned sort of business unionism, bureaucratic unionism, class struggle as uh, distinct from that. Uh, and then um, in the book, I know you also talk about liberal unionism as distinct from class struggle unionism. Can you bring us into a little bit to like the distinctions between those? What's the distinction between class struggle unionism and business unionism, bring us a little bit more deeply into that. And then as well, liberal unionism, which I want to explore even more. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I think I mentioned for the first, you know, hundred some years and, and beyond of union history, um, the main sort of competitors were class struggle unionism and, and business unionism. And, you know, I think I, it can kind of be summed up in the slogan. Yeah, the class struggle unionism believes that labor creates all wealth. Um, and the business unionism is really has a lot more limited, you know, sort of analysis and objective um, fighting simply for a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. Um, so the sort of differences, I mean, I think we can look at um, how different unions are, are fit within that. Certainly the American Federation of Labor, which was the main labor federation existing from the mid 1880s up until it merged with the CIO uh, into the AFL-CIO, uh, really typified most of it business unionism. It's a form of unionism which, which views itself as having a very narrow role of representing workers in a particular plant or class or craft. So when you see today even um, the biz, you know, when you see the craft unions, certain craft unions being willing to sell out other public employees or public workers um, just so that they can get some jobs for their members. That's, have, that's them having a very narrow viewpoint and not really operating on a sort of uh, class-wide perspective. In contrast, the class struggle unionists, uh, you know, we can look back historically, we had, in contrast to the American Federation of Labor, we had the industrial workers of the world, which flourished in the early years of the 1900s, let, led some of the greatest strikes in U.S. labor history, the bread and roses strikes, many other strikes um, that were sort of bitter, bitter struggles, uh, you know, with the employer class. The class struggle unionists, whereas the AFL, you know, was exclusion, uh, excluded foreign workers often, didn't want to organize them, um, was, uh, you know, many of the constituent unions were racist and um, didn't allow African-American workers. Um, in contrast, the IWW and other unions out of the class struggle trend, um, you know, favored the, the inclusion of all workers and saw that as central to their unionism. Uh, when you go down in terms of specifics, in terms of what are the differences, uh, I think, uh, you know, in the book I talk about there really being, you know, four, four or five key differences. One of them is class struggle unionists um, believe that it's, uh, you know, the UE has a term them and us, you know, that there's, uh, you know, the employer class and the, and the working class have different interests on every issue. Um, so whereas, you know, often, you know, the business unionists are trying to make accommodations with employers, often view the workers as unreasonable, utilizing business agents who kind of look down on, uh, on the workers. You know, I think the class struggle unionists see that there's conflict is inherent in it and conflict's a good thing and that's how we make gains. Um, I think there's a big difference uh, in terms of the, the role of the shop store floor struggle um, because 
class struggle unionists start their analysis with the shop floor or the workplace and seeing that as a source of exploitation and power and privilege in society, they also view the fight over what happens during the workplace as key because they see that and employers know it well and I know it as a bargainer, the work rules matter and the sort of what goes on during the workday is about power and control and how much the, the boss can exploit you. So for that reason, there's been a fundamental difference. I think Tony Gilpin's book, uh, the long deep, deep grudge, you know, which was published by uh, Haymarket a couple of years ago, is a great example of the difference between, you know, sort of the UAW, which turned into a business union, um, versus, uh, you know, the the FE, which was a lot more militant and had shot for a struggle. Just real briefly, I'll just touch on two more points with it, um, which is, um, you know, the the. The class struggle unionists that I've known over the course of my, you know, several decades in the labor movement strongly believe in the working class much must lead its own struggles. So, so what you find is a lot of emphasis on, you know, like labor notes and Teamsters for Democratic Union, which really, you know, at their core believe in, you know, uh, reform movements and workers, you know, sort of running their own affairs and and running their unions as opposed to the business unionism which was often bureaucratic and think experts and they're the experts and should be running stuff. And then finally, uh, there's, a, there's a big difference in terms of, uh, you know, how do we view the role of the government and the National Labor Relations Board and all these institutions? I think the class struggle unionists traditionally saw the government had a big role in, in really protecting the system. Uh, of, uh, you know, uh, exploiting workers and we're kind of suspicious about uh, about the role of the government as a protector, whereas the business union is more see the government as neutral or even being willing to step in on, on their side. And then, you know, so that's kind of the basic differences. What's interesting to me about, I mean, there's a lot that's interesting, but like in terms of the actual work that we do as organizers, is that at the at the basis? It's how do we understand what's happening when we work, <laughs> when we sell our labor, and how much is is this about the exploitation, the theft of our work, which is not a concept that uh, is broadly shared uh, in amongst workers and in the union move, uh, union movement right now. To the or the I don't even want to call it a, a, a movement. Um, in unions right now, that, that the, the issue of how do we understand what's happening on the shop floor? Is this about power uh, or is this about figuring out how we can work together because we want to accommodate the boss? Because from, from what we are, so what's all around us, which is that, yeah, the boss has interests, we have interests. We're just going to kind of figure those out so the best we can so that everybody kind of gets their needs met to no, it's us versus them. We don't share our interests. How, what do we do to bring that sort of political consciousness forward? Because it is about a way we understand the world. Uh, it's not just a way we do business. <laughs> uh, and you talk about sort of the difference between sort of organizing skills and class struggle unionism, that those are different, that when we're going on strike, we're going on strike as class struggle unionists based on an understanding that this is about theft, this is about taking back what's ours, and it's about being part of a broader movement. Uh, so how do we how do we develop that consciousness? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I'd say a couple of things. One is, um, you, you know, in part, the the sort of conflict and consciousness is sort of inherent in the workplace. So what business unionists do is a lot of time is you know, trying to downplay the struggle in the workplace because they're interested merely in, you know, getting the contract settled, getting their, um, uh, you know, stability for their union and, you know, making for some of them being, you know, some of the more lazy business agents may not, you know, if, if they're picking fights in the workplace, that means it's more work for them, you know, so they don't necessarily have an incentive. I think class struggle unionists, you know, more kind of embrace this, uh, you know, sort of conflict in the workplace and see it as a good and valuable thing. So, you know, obviously, I think to the extent that we believe that, 
you know, by engaging in struggle, by people engaging in solidarity, that's how, how they learn. I, I think historically what we've seen is, you know, more fighting unions. So if you look at the UE, you, you know, where you're picking battles on the workplace, I think that helps build that sort of consciousness. So I think that's one point of it. And I think that's, you know, frankly, I think a lot of what Labor Notes has fostered over the years in terms of putting the movement back in the labor movement is, you know, let's pick these fights. Let's kind of organize on the shop floor and, and get these battles. But I think the other thing is, you know, also how do we, you know, how do we talk about it? How do we talk about our struggles? You know, we're not talking about it just as, you know, sort of individual battles. I think it's very important to be kind of tying our particular fights into the broader fights of the working class, you know, because every, every fight, every strike that we have, every battle we have, is you know a particular of a bigger struggle that other workers are having against their employers whether it's you know the recent strike wave you know there's you know a lot of the demands of the workers in that strike wave were pretty ambitious i mean i think the the staff negotiators in many of the situations had a lot more limited agenda but at least the the workers involved you know wanted to you know control their shifts you know the weekend work they wanted to control you know, the IATSE wanted to, the early demands were who gets the revenue streams, you know, it was about, you know, it was about power and control. Um, so I think, I think that matters. And then I think, you know, the, the better class struggle unionists, you know, do a real political education on an ongoing basis, you know, in terms of how they talk about stuff. There was just an article in Jacobin magazine this morning about Tony Mazaki and how he built a militant union. And he was from OCA, the oil, chemical and atomic workers, kind of the leader in helping getting OSHA passed, but also the labor party in the nineties um, and a big, uh, you know, attendee at, uh, anyway. So he, uh, Anyway, so so I think you have to you know be sort of educating uh, on that level too. Yeah. So the so the question of political education and like I think about you know like how it's not just your boss but it's bosses. Uh, it's not just bosses but it's capitalists. Like how do we bring people to uh, from the shop floor to seeing the larger structures of power that are really what we're up against, which is why we then can come to know ourselves as a class not simply workers on the shop floor, but part of a larger struggle. Um, but that makes me think about then you talk about uh, liberal unionism. And uh, I'm wondering if you could speak to that because it seems that you know, part of what liberal unionism does as you uh, name it and speak about it is that it does say, well, there are larger social political issues that we need to take on. Uh, that and And so how does, how does liberal unionism contrast with class struggle unionism as you see it? Yeah. So wh when I started in the labor movement, you know, in the, in the 1980s, um, you know, towards the end of the mid end of the 1980s, there was really, you know, there's still kind of a lot of the sort of class struggles trend around, you know, folks who had gone into the labor movement in the seventies and, and, and really, um, uh, you know, a vibrant anti-concessions movement, a uh, movement against the uh, team concept, which was this labor management cooperation. Mike Parker, who recently passed, you know, played a key role in that uh, you know, of labor notes. Um, but, but, you know, beginning in the mid 1980s, there there kind of developed this whole new trend in the labor movement, which I call labor liberalism. And it was really kind of hard to get get our hands on it because um, you know, whereas, whereas I think the class struggle unionists at the time saw, you know, militancy sort of developing a labor movement capable of, of violating labor law, saw the need for um, opposing labor management cooperation, and very much were based on this idea that the, there's this union bureaucracy, which had different interests, and were often an impediment to, you know, moving the struggle forward. So they focused on building reform movements and so forth. But in the mid-1980s, this whole new analysis starts to develop and you know, I mean, I think it was typified by SEIU, the service employees in the 1990s and their purple jackets, they were leading the way. Um, and really, you know, for them, it was about organizing techniques. It was about how much money we put into organizing, you know, rather than the sort of direct class on class, it was focused on that. And the way they talked about stuff was the language of the middle class social movements, you know, so it, uh, it so it had a, a good ring to it, right? It was, and it had, and it made a lot of gains. 
decades, it did a lot of important stuff because the labor movement in the 1980s, or frankly, was horrible, terrible, terrible, terrible. Bad positions on immigration, bad positions on race, most social issues, uh, you know, anti-communist. There was a lot of bad stuff about it, and they kind of helped break beyond that, right? And 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 sort of you know push for a more outward-looking, inclusive labor movement. Um, but and over the years, I think they've developed, you know, there's been a lot of accomplishments. But I think we also, you know, need to, and I think some of us at the time had a, a little more critical view of it. Um, you know, I think we've seen books from Steve Early, you know, about, you know, three, four or five books on it, you know, that, that kind of analyze, uh, you know, the sort of shortcomings of this form of unionism. And by the way, I'm, it's it's not just SEIU. I think it's kind of you know many of the worker center movements, even you know a lot of the central labor councils and the AFL kind of adopt this sort of philosophy, you know, which has a bunch of different forms. But I think the big differences with class struggle unionism are um, one, you know, while it is it really you, know, you can go back to the key components um you know are they really into them and us unionism you know do they really see this as a battle between workers or as employers I, they have a lot a lot of the unions ended up you know with andy stern who was kind of leading proponent of this in the 1990s ended up you know revealing his true colors as as a sort of a management uh, lackey uh you know serving on certain boards and and uh um but beyond that, you know, the the role of workers leading their own struggle, you know, a lot of these initiatives, they because they have a more limited view, uh, they, they often think it's about more about wages than about, you know, sort of workplace struggle and workplace control. Many times their objectives are, um, you know, when you look at the fight for 15, you know, which had a lot of good elements, but at the end of the day, you know, a lot of it was really geared towards passing, you know, legislation and using these strikes and workers as, you know, sort of media props in, in, in getting legislation passed rather than, you know, what I think both the business unionists and the class struggle unionists would do, would view it as, you know, sort of fighting at the point of production. And that's really the, the core of unionism. I, I, I think some of these institutions ended up, uh, as I think Steve Early has pointed out, um, being uh, less open and participatory than the business unionists that they sought to replace, you know, creating these huge locals spanning the entire East Coast or West Coast that workers couldn't possibly control. Um, you get worker centers, which, you know, have some, you know, many good um, elements, but they're not funded by workers. Many, most of the funding comes from foundations. Structurally, you know, it's not like a union where the workers at least have the chance of electing their leadership in a lot of these because they're set up as nonprofits. So anyway, so so I think I, I, I think or I, I, I think it's time to realize that this sort of labor liberalism, which has been sort of the a guiding philosophy for the last couple decades among even progressive trade unionists, has run its course. And that and that we can't just continue on this path, that we need to really go back to you know, a, a really what I view as a more solid form of unionism, class struggle unionism, which a lot of people have been out there and practicing and 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 doing, right? But it hasn't really been as much, you know, um, uh, you know, sort of spread out there as this is a, a separate trend that we need to develop in the labor movement, which has different objectives. One of the reasons that I uh, sort of really wanted to dig into this, which is the first part of the book where you lay this out is that um, I do a lot of work in labor notes with uh, caucus development, uh, primarily in uh, public education, uh, you know, pre-K uh, through higher ed. And people will come uh, to labor notes and have questions. They say, you know, they're upset with their union leadership in some way, and they want to think about what to do about that. And they want to get support about how to, uh, Change, well, they want to get support. And one of the, the questions that always emerges uh, when I'm talking to people who are involved in caucus development is are, is are they actually organizing around, um, as, as you talk about it in the book, like setting up a different poll about like, this is the kind of union we want. Are we developing a caucus because 
we want to we have an a, a, an idea of the kind of union that we need in this you know, class struggle unionism, or do we have an issue that we want to take up? And those I think are two really important distinctions uh, that sometimes you have people coming to say like I you know I want to form a caucus because we want to uh, make sure we want to. Uh, make sure that our union takes on an education sort of ending high stakes testing, but they're not actually interested in changing how the union operates. They just want to take on that issue. And so I think it's for, for people who are listening to this, who, who are thinking about union transformation, I think the question of setting up, of acting from a position that says, what kind of union do we want to be? How do we understand the nature of uh, the relationships of power and the structures of power is a, is a critical component to this, that it's not that we're not just taking on issues. We're taking on the very idea of how do workers fight. And I think that's one of the things you do in the book that's really important. So. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. And, you know, in the book, I. Uh, quote Bill Fetcher and uh, Fernando Gapacin in their book Solidarity Divided, where they talk about um, that, you know, some of the, you know, sort of reorganization of the labor movement really weren't dealing with, you know, having a different politics and structure and mission, you know, which was really what they saw as key and which I, I, I agree is, is key. Um, so I so I think that comes up in in uh, a, a lot of different contexts in, in terms of uh, you know to to you know it's not just about electing new leaders or it's not just about engaging in struggle or it's not just about like having new organizing techniques right you can go out and you know organize a worker center or go out and organize this but what are what what are you, what what are you really trying to do. And I, I think the best example, you know, and a lot of people talk about them, but this is Chicago teachers, you know, which, you know, some people will say it's about organizing and how they organize, but really, they really prompted this whole reform movement and the teachers are always pushed it along um, by having a sort of different vision and politics, both in terms of, you know, fundamentally, uh, the teacher unionism in, in a lot of states had basically caved into the neoliberal Democrats and, and viewed themselves as being closely tied to them. And that was kind of core to teacher unionism. And, you know, I think the Chicago teachers, you know, came forward and kind of broke out of that, you know, and they said, you know, both, we're going to break with these Democratic mayors where necessary, we're going to take on the privatizers, we're going to, uh, but they also had a vision of like, what does it look like internally? You know, what is our union? How does our union look differently? And I think that's really the core of class struggle unionism. And, and I think the final piece is, you know, I think that, yeah, I, I talk about it a little bit, but, you know, I think class struggle unionists typically had the idea of they weren't just kind of reforming their own little local, which is important, but also had a vision for what does the labor movement need to look like and how can we, you know, sort of by our actions and our participation, try and change the entire labor movement, you know, to fight, you know, more effectively for the working class. So, so I want to dig into this idea a little bit about, um, and see if I can grab the quote here that I wanted to uh, pull out. Um, where you say, um, if we think this, uh, the problem is simply one of organizing strategies, we will put no demands on the leadership of our unions. Uh, there's a lot packed into that sentence. Can you talk a little bit first about sort of your, your critique in the book of a focus or a, a, a belief that somehow if we just have the right strategies, if we just do our organizing skills, that we will uh, lead to transformation. What, what's your, can you talk more about your critique of that frame? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the, it, certainly in the last decade or decade and a half or so, I, I think a lot of folks, you know, kind of looked around the labor movement and most of the unions are, I, if we have an honest assessment of the state of most unions, international unions and local unions, a lot of them are pretty bureaucratic, ineffective, don't really want to fight. They, they have a lot of features of business unionism. And 
you know, so I think a lot of folks looked at that and said, well, you know, I, I, I don't really want to participate in that. I'm just going to, you know, cut my little piece of the labor movement and I'm going to develop skills and I'm going to organize workers and, 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 and just try and do that on their own. And it's really kind of a, 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 a it, it ends up being a more limited view um, because um, if we're going to turn the labor movement around, we need a labor movement uh, or we need a trend within the labor movement, which is sort of demanding change uh, of the entire labor movement. We can't just do it in our in our corners or our pieces of the labor movement. It's probably best to give a, a couple of examples. I, I think if you look back in the 1980s um, when you know, I think it was labor notes, but I think there was a lot of other, you know, trends in the labor movement. Um, they both fought concessions in their particular workplaces, but they came together to put out a demand for the entire labor movement that we do no concessions. And they tried to popularize that and there were conferences, national rank and file against concessions. Um, key battles were kind of coalesced around like the Hormel strike, which I end up talking about a lot. Um, but, you know, in, in 86 in Hormel, Minnesota, I'm from Minnesota, so that's kind of where I got my start. But, but, it, but it was a kind of cause celeb nationally, right? All of the unionists came together, the radical sort of class struggle unionists came together. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't, it was supporting that battle, but it was also, hey, the rest of the labor movement uh, needs to have this sort of philosophy. When you look at the opposition to labor management cooperation programs, which swept through the labor movement in the early 1990s and really did untold damage to us and our solidarity in unions like the auto workers and so forth, you know, we, we, it wasn't just a question of organizing around that. It was a question of putting out a different poll in the labor movement. I know in Minnesota, we organized conferences and put together a conference with a lot of the old P9 support in, in the early 90s, we were surprised when 400 workers showed up because they were all urgently wanting to know how to fight these programs. So, so anyway, so I, so I think, I, I think at the core of class struggle unionism is sort of putting out, uh, you know, demands for for an effective labor movement. Um, and I think, you know, the labor liberals, I think, have been a lot better at that. They, they write a lot more. They do a lot more in terms of, you know, putting forward ideas. But often their ideas are, in my opinion, wrong. So. <laughs> Can, wrong ideas about the kind of labor? Yeah. yeah so, so, so like recently, you know, I think there's a, there's, there's a big push to sectoral bargaining and yeah we need to you know look broader than our workplaces but they're really trying to get this government sponsored theme you know scheme where uh, you know government mediators and government control of the bargaining process and you know i think we know from experience and i know from having done like interest arbitrations where you arbitrate what the terms of the contracts are that I, I would shudder at the idea that, you know, some lawyer arbitrator is going to decide what the contract terms because they're going to give you absolute crap. They do it. I've, I've done them, you know, so so I think it's it's just a different vision about what sort of labor movement we need, you know, whereas, you know, I think a class struggle trend would say, OK, yeah, we need to develop solidarity, but we need to cut through these laws, which, you know, uh, for, you know, sort of prevent us from engaging in these you know, sort of class wide struggles or no strike clauses or, you know, sort of challenging the system of labor control, which has really hemmed us in rather than, you know, running to the government to get even more layers of, you know, sort of bureaucracy and control. So, so that's another uh, thought that I had reading this book and then in general, um, which is you talk about, you know, that we need to develop uh unions, uh, workers that are prepared to, to violate labor law, uh, that, that we need to be prepared, that we cannot be constrained by labor law. Uh, we're going to have to violate labor law uh, in order uh, to, to build the power that we need to win. Um, and I'm, you know, I do a lot of, uh, you know, workshops and there's always somebody in every workshop who's like, we just need to go on strike. Uh, and I'm always thinking like, yeah, I totally agree with that. I totally agree we need to violate labor law. Uh, how do we get there? What are, the, what are the tactics we use 
because too often the people who are calling for strikes, the people are not ready to go. So what does your book teach us about what do we do to get to the place where we have the commitment to violate labor law? So yeah, so I, I, I think I talk about it a little bit that um, thinking about building class struggle unions can be somewhat abstract, but you can also look at it. I, I don't think you can have class struggle unionism without class struggle tactics, because if we don't have a labor movement able to take on capital and win battles and engage in militancy without getting crushed, then we're just going to be left with sort of a, you know, strident verbiage. You know, we can talk a lot, but we but we can't do it. So wh what is it, you know, what would it take to kind of build a, a, a you know, sort of movement based on uh, class struggle tactics? Well, for one, I think it's hard to see it happening if we don't have a worker led movement. Um, I think a lot of the control that the employing class has over unions is, you know, through the staff and, you know, threatening the survival of the unions or sanctions and so forth. Um, massive fines, like $20 million fines they did on the American pilots, uh, you know, years ago. Um, and, and that's a real constraint on militancy. But it's also, you know, what are a sort of set of ideas that, that folks would need to be able to engage in these types of actions? Um, and, you know, I, I think when we look back through labor history, um, there's clearly in, in most of the struggles, there's a, a turning point where the, the workers ha have to decide, um, you know, you talk about the 1934 uh, Teamster uh, trucker strike in Minnesota, in the Twin Cities, or you can talk about the West Coast longshoremen uh, workers and really that there were like key points where they had to decide the employer was kind of crushing down on them and then they had a choice are we going to expand the struggle through solidarity or are we going to back down and that what they found is every time is that when they were able to you know sort of expand the struggle that's where they were able to come to victory and even you know my my second book i wrote um was uh, 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 called Strike Back, and it was about the teachers and public employees strike wave of the 60s and 70s. And really, I, I, I wrote it both to tell the story, but it was kind of like, how did millions of public workers in the 1960s and 70s come to violate labor law? Striking was illegal in every jurisdiction in the United States uh, in the late 50s. And, and until the late 60s, really. Uh, and, and yet millions and millions of workers went out on strike. And how were they able to do that? You know, they found strength in numbers. They expanded the strike. All of the Baltimore workers go out, you know, once one group goes out. Um, you, you know, they had solidarity. They had internal functioning that made it happen. Um, so I think we can learn a lot. We can learn from the recent uh, teachers uh, strike down in uh, the red states, right, um, where, you know, I think they had a slogan or someone had told them, go, go it all together or don't go at all. You know what I mean? If they had struck one school district in West Virginia, what would have happened? They probably would have all been fired. They went out statewide. So I think, I, I think there's a lot of ways that we can do it. I, I agree with you. It's easier said than done. You know, we can, we can talk about it. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think engaging in these struggles and trying to expand them. Um, but I, but I do know that if we don't start putting that back on the agenda of the labor movement and we keep on talking about like, you know, just about social unionism or just about organizing skills or just about X or Y, we're never going to get there. And I do finally would say, I, I, I do think it was on the agenda, at least in, in, the, in the late 1980s, you, you know, where we had these bitter strikes and they were losing. And at least, you know, some of the unions were trying to break beyond it. So you had the Hermel workers sending out picket lines to, you know, other plants, you know, and, 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 and having this ferocious response from the labor, you know, the international union, you know, trusting their local and, and, and really trying to shut that down. So, so I do think that there, there, there is and has been a, a trend, um, you know, you know, which, you know, which had, has sought to seek those tactics. Yeah, I um, am regularly on calls and was just on a call last night uh, talking about contract campaigns. And the question comes up like all the time, well, we can't, what do we do because we can't strike? 
And um, I just refuse to answer that question as it's posed. You know, the, you know, the question is, how do you build the power so that you do strike? Uh, and, and whether or not it's legal is irrelevant. The question is, can you build the power to win? Uh, and here in Massachusetts, uh, where I am, uh, where public sector workers are uh, not allowed to strike, we had a successful teacher strike uh, two years ago in Dedham, Mass., uh, and uh, here in Tewksbury, have educators talking about striking, and the MTA has assured that they are building a strike fund now, even though striking is illegal in Massachusetts. Uh, because to your point, it's what we have to do. We have to be prepared to violate uh, labor law in in order to win and in, in order to really uh, have the movement, the labor movement. Um, I have a ton more questions about this, but I want to remind folks that uh, if you have questions, to go ahead and put them in the chat, uh, and Dana's going to feed them back to me, and uh, and then we'll talk about those as well. So please go ahead and do that. I want to sort of take another line of question for a moment, uh, Joe, if that's okay. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've experienced in certain settings where I, I work, and again, I work primarily uh, in education, but it, with other other unions, especially around caucus development, um, is it, as as uh, one of my comrades said, like it's hard sometimes to even get people to use the word class. Uh, and in certain sort of circles, when you start talking about class, uh, it it soon becomes that you're a class reductionist. Uh, and you talk in your book about sort of the relationship between anti-racism, uh, anti-sexism as, as a key part of what class struggle unionism is about. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's an important point. And, and I think if you look back historically at, um, you know, some of what I view as the class struggle unions, or they view themselves as class struggle unions, um, one of the defining features is they were, um, you know, put anti-racism and anti-sexism at the core of, uh, of what they did. And it, w it wasn't like a, a side note, um, but it stems from their analysis of, of employment. And, I, you know, we can't, you know, we talked at the beginning of the discussion about, you know, how the employment transaction, you know, exploits the workers and the, and the billionaire classes created from that. Um, but I think class struggle unionists also understand that not everyone is uh, treated equally in that, in that transaction and that um, employers benefit from uh, discrimination. You know, they discriminate, they, they, you know, they help build the whole modern system of capitalism or, or the, the, the system we live in now um, was really uh, built on the, on, the, on the basis of slave labor and the sort of taking of the value that, the, that, that slaves produce. And they continued that um, by, you know, having a differential that existed uh, in, in wages and access to jobs and in society um, far beyond that. So it was really kind of core to it. And I think because of that, when you look at the class struggle unionists like the, uh, you know, the, the Communist Party, you know, in the 1930s and beyond, one of the keys to their success in terms of uh, helping win unionism in the South was that, you know, core to their mission is, you, you know, like they, they saw, you know, the anti-lynching struggle and the, the struggle over like the Scottsboro uh, Nine as, as as being key to that. So I think, I, I, I don't think, um, I, I think it has to be core to it. And, you know, just to kind of distinguish it, you know, because I think a lot of the labor liberalism, you know, they, 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 they certainly, you know, and a lot of the national unions will talk about, um, you know, diversity and anti, maybe not so much anti-racism, but, 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 you know, you know, those sort of themes and including all workers. Um, but, you know, I think it's when you get to some core issues that come up, you know, what are the role of cop unions? You know, are, are you willing to, you know, as a labor movement, kind of take a stand on this in terms of uh, police brutality and what are the role of police unions? And then you see a lot of folks starting to shy away, whereas I think the, the, the class struggle unionists would be more willing to kind of push and continue that, that type of discussion. 
because they understand the nature of the police as as defending the capitalists. Yeah, exactly. There's a political analysis there that 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 works. But the, as you were talking, I was thinking about you know I come out of the NEA as the uh, the national union uh, that I'm part of, and the degree to which. Uh, NEA uses some of the best social justice language, if you're just talking about social justice language, that you're going to hear uh, as leadership, that's people of color, uh, but um, has not been a place of actually organizing workers to push back on the shop floor uh, to, uh, you know, they've, they've been very much in bed with the Democratic Party, uh, you know, throughout the Obama administration, when public education was being crushed by his policies, we were not being uh, incited or excited or educated to actively push back on that by using our worker power to do so. And I see that sort of as as a an example of how uh, the the social justice issues can be um, caught up in labor liberalism in a way that uh, that eludes a, a real analysis of structures of power. And I think that's something that we as a labor movement have to figure out how we're going to be more explicit about and take up. Uh, because in because I think we, the, in so many ways, that's like an obstacle right now to us developing a multiracial class struggle unionism. That's just my thoughts about that. And I think your book offers us ways to think about that. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's certain types of issues where, um, you, you know, and I think especially like labor liberalism is good talking about it, but you know, when we, when we start to develop sort of militant social movements in, 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 in other areas or, you know, like African-American militancy, then then the question of how are we going to relate to those movements and do we see it as a tight alliance, um, not just when it's you know, the sort of comfortable talking. We also find it coming up in international questions where historically the class struggle unionists charted a different course. Um, you know, I think the official labor movement or sort of the business unionists, the AFL and later the AFL-CIO, um, had a very tight tie with the U.S. government. Um, and, you know, in terms of sponsoring or even supporting repression uh, around the world in, in, in support of the U.S. government. And when class struggle unionists sort of stepped out of line and and, and tried to fight that, you know, they often got red baited or kind of, uh, you know, attempted to push them or did push them out of the labor movement. And, you know, I think that that that's really, you know, that, that it's times like that where you really, you know, you can say what side are you on, but you really see kind of the, the colors come out or in the militant struggles, you know, like the P9 struggle you saw you know, progressive trade union has had to, had to choose, you know, are, are you going to support this or not? So, so th that brings me to uh, another question I have. And again, if I can just find the passage here real quick in the book. Um, uh, give me one moment. Um, you say, uh, we need to be clear. The point of unionism is to fight for better conditions for the working class not to overthrow the capitalist system. And uh, that leads me to the question of like, so where, where do socialists fit in to this struggle? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, when I, when I think about it and write in the book, it, it, it's on class struggle unionism, but it's not a book about socialism or that everyone who adheres to this needs to be a socialist. Now, many of the folks who believe in this um, will, will uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, either share or develop that, that analysis. Um, I, I, I do think, I, I, I do talk in the book about the limits of trade unionism and that, you know, what does it mean to look beyond trade unionism? Because I think we all need to understand that um, even if we have like a strong class struggle trade union movement and we're militant and we're winning gains for workers and we got power on the shop floor, uh, the outcome of the employment transaction will still be to create 
billionaires, millionaires and billionaires, and they will have power and they will use that power against us. And that's indeed what happened in the 1950s and 60s. The labor movement thought that they were, you know, it was a three-way, you know, labor management and the government running the country. What was happening is these millionaires and billionaires were developing uh, who, you know, money is power and they use it against us. So, 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 so we, trade unionism has its limits. And, you know, I, I believe that, um, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, we can't just have a union movement that we need to develop a socialist movement, but I don't think we're going to develop that if we can't develop class struggle unions. Yeah, I mean, part of why that passage grabbed me so much is that so much of how I understand what's essential to class struggle unionism is, is naming the structures of power, the structures of capital, and how they operate. Uh, and so... You know, there is then that space where you're, you know, we, we, we create in the, we, uh, opportunities develop in the shop floor struggles for, for the, uh, on, for development of consciousness about way, the way power works, uh, in capital, how that, that's such an essential piece of this, it just seems to me. That uh, is why national unions like the NEA aren't going to go there because they're class traders, because they're part of the elite. Um, and yet it, it, it like I, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of like it, we need a socialist movement as well. But I guess what I always wonder about is like how explicitly socialist should we be in our class struggle unionism in terms of not only of, of naming capital and how it how it exploits us yeah. does, that, does that question make sense no it does and, and look I, I i think we need to um i you know i think when i think about the book and i think about class struggle unionism i think of the broadest possible tent which is you know class struggle unionism is you know th those who um view the employment transaction as illegitimate and as as being the you know exploitation of workers and i think you know uh, many of the people who hold that view may be socialists or unions could be class struggle unionists but not everyone has to you know sort of self-identify as a as a socialist to be a class struggle unionist in my opinion right um i i think that um once you start start following this path of analysis, um, I, I think you, people can and should come to the conclusion that just developing class struggle unionism is is not going to be enough. That we need to sort of deepen the analysis. I I, I do to your to your other point there is I, I I do think we need to be a lot more explicit about our our unionism and our class analysis and our understanding of the you know role of the uh, of the government and the billionaires or capitalists i tend to call them in the book the billionaire class just because it's not technically you know the best term but i think it's a lot more uh, accessible and, and popular great um so i've asked some of all the lots of questions I'd like to talk about, but we also have some questions here uh, that are being posted from the chat. So um, uh, go ahead and let's take some of these up. And I'm sorry, I don't know who they're coming from. I would introduce you, but uh, um, got a question here that is about um, a, let's see, approach, uh, uh, Tony Mazzocchi approach, the Labor Party and politics uh, generally seems like the polar opposite of how many argued to prioritize passing the PRO Act recently. Uh, what do you think is the role of politics in class struggle unionism? So I, I, I think one of the, you know, one of the sort of uh, key features of class struggle unionism is that, uh, you know, I think uh, we understand the need for independent uh, labor politics. Um, and really is a concern of the sort of 
stranglehold that the Democratic Party has on the leadership of the trade union movement. You know, I think when I think about it, there's a lot of problems with sort of the close ties, not least of which is we continually elect Democrats. They promise change. They promise labor reforms and we never get them. So so in that sense, it's it's sort of wasted money. But I think even worse is the 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 Democratic Party is a party of the you know, you know ultimately um, which supports and is largely funded by the billionaire class or the capitalist class, and the sort of alliance with the Democrats really introduces a lot of. Uh, corporate ideas. So we talked earlier about the teacher unions, where a lot of ideas of uh, cooperating with the privatizers, you know, came, came through the ties with the Democratic uh, Party. But we also see that, you know, with the, you know, even the, I talked about the labor liberals even being tied more into the Democrats, you know, than perhaps some of the business unionists, because they see what they're doing is passing this legislation and they and they want to get there. So I think Tony Mazaki, you know, he said the bosses have two parties. It's time for workers to have one, you know, and a lot of us uh, who were around in the 1990s supported Labor Party advocates, which he played a key role. UE played a big role in that. You know, a lot of other progressive unionists uh, uh, supported that. Um, and, you know, ultimately it didn't, uh, you know, result in the formation of the Labor Party, but I think it raised a lot of issues. Yeah, I mean, I of the many ways I think about uh, this question, um, first of all, if we look at like the whole focus on passing the PRO Act, uh, it, it, it's about sort of how we understand where our power is and direction of power, uh, the vectors of power. So we look up to the powerful to change the laws rather than we act to change the laws. Uh, what we want from the PRO Act, we can and should be able to win through organizing in many ways. So we have to violate the law in order to win. And, and so I think there that just the to the degree that we focus on if we change the laws, the legislation about this, it 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 removes our understanding of our own power. Our power becomes about voting rather than our power is about controlling the shop floor uh, and our capacity to withhold our labor. And I I, I think that's a for me when I was MTA president, I got a lot of uh, hassle for not spending time in the state house, uh, and my thing was like, when we build enough power, they'll come to us. Uh, but I, I think there, it's a key mistake that we make when we are looking outside of ourselves as workers for the power that we need. Um, and other critiques about that, but I won't go into them now, because uh, we have another question. Um, to speak to the idea of the militant minority, what that means and the arguments for and against. Yeah, so in, in recent uh, years, I, 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 one of the good things in recent years is there's been a sort of, uh, you know, maybe starting with the Bernie Sanders campaign and the growth of the Dem DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, a lot of younger folks interested in the labor movement. There's been a lot more interest in some of these sort of uh, class struggle union ideas. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar, the idea of the militant minority is really, you know, kind of reaching back into the 1920s and the, you know, sort of William Z. Foster, who was in the young Communist Party back then and who, uh, you know, spoke a lot about the need for a militant minority and actually, you know, worked to organize uh, one in the 1920s, which is a whole different story. But um so, 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 so a lot of people see that. And, you know, on one hand, I, I and I do, I, I, I have like a whole, I probably sub chapter on the militant minority, um, because I think it's an important concept. And a lot of people think about it as, you know, the militant minority is like, let's gather the folks who want to fight, they're kind of the you know, sort of spark plugs of the uh, of it, and we're going to focus on the active portion of any workplace or the working class as a whole who want to engage in battle, and we're going to help and work with them to engage in battle. Um, and I think that's uh, important. But I also think that you know, when I look back at the writings on the militant minority, um, it, at its core was also a program to change the entire labor movement. 
So it wasn't just an organizational technique. It was sort of a set of demands. So in the 1920s, you know, Foster's groups he worked with, like the Trade Union Educational League and Unity League, they put out like for railroad workers, here's the 10 points that we need to do. And they kind of organized around them, um, you know, fight for amalgamation of the unions, go against the Railway Labor Act, all this stuff. So so I think, I, I think some of the conversation about the militant minority lately misses that. But, but, I, but I think it's a, a component. And I view some of these items as component parts of class struggle unionism, which is the overall philosophy. And then these are, you know, both the organizational and programmatic, you know, sort of uh, uh, methods to employ. You speak in the book about how we sort of need to approach this in a variety of different ways. There's not like one path uh, that we're going to choose. Yeah, exactly. And I and look at I, I I think class struggle unionism is a is a big tent. And once you start getting within it, you know, people can argue and and different class struggle unionists could argue all night about the differences they have on how do we relate to the labor bureaucracy, you know, how much do we focus on union reform? There's all kind should we even work within the existing unions? You know, some of the industrial workers of the uh, IWW today would say, no, we need to build our own unions, you know. So there's a lot of different viewpoints. And I think that's all good and fine, but we need like a big tent, right? Because we all, if we all agree on sort of the, the, the overall, then we don't have to agree on all these, uh, uh, you know, different points. And a lot of times, like in the 1970s and different periods, you know, folks focus too much on their differences with each other rather than, um, you know, what's our differences with the, you know, moving forward, the labor movement or fighting the bosses. So that, uh, leads to the next uh, question we have here, which is, um, do you ever worry about workers observing critiques of union bureaucracy at the broad strokes level, missing the nuances and turning towards an anti-union stance? And certainly I've, I've seen that happen. Uh, just talking recently in labor notes about uh, folks who came to one of our you know, Secret Service successful organizer training and they were not in the union. They decided to leave the union uh, because they were so pissed off at the union. Um, and we've been discussing sort of like, how do we take that on? So you want to speak to that a little bit, Joe? Yeah, no, I, I, look at, I, and I think we see that out there um, where there's certain uh, so-called left groups who, you know, spend all their time attacking, you know, to them, Every strike is a, you know, uh, every strike settlement's a betrayal. Every, you know, er everything's about the union leadership betraying the workers, and there's no good to be found in anything. And I think that easily turns into anti-unionism. Um, I, I think we need to have a more balanced approach. I think um, our main focus, at least in my view, is not just on. Uh, uh, critiquing the union bureaucracy. I think uh, Kim Moody and his uh, excellent uh, uh, work, the rank and file strategy, um, talks about, you know, going back to the 1930s and, and Farrell Dobbs and the Teamster Struckers, how they talk about it was, um, you know, turning the, putting the fire on the employer and the union bureaucrats are in the crossfire and they have to, you know, decide to get with you or, or not, but the fire is directed at the employer and in the course of the struggle, you're transforming the unions. They're either coming with you or else you'll be able to push them aside. So I think that's, to me, that's that that's the basic thing. But I, I, I do think it is, you know, it, once you start getting into this sort of analysis and throwing around terms like labor liberals or this or that, you know, the danger is people just start like, you know, throwing them around and doing it based on ideas rather than, you know, uh, activity. Yeah, and, and my experience in the caucus that I'm a part of in uh, Educators for a Democratic Union and the Mass Teachers Association and working with caucuses uh, across the country is that certainly what happens is that the union bureaucrats accuse caucus uh, members of being anti-union, uh, of being divisive. Uh, and I think that complicates this question that the person has asked. Uh, and, and that it becomes really important to what I was saying earlier uh, for uh, dissident caucuses, members to have a, 
to be really grounded in an understanding that the goal is to transform the union uh, and, and, and to be clear about that in all of their activity. That this is about transformation. It's about creating a more democratic union, a more red, uh, militant union, a more rank and file union, a more transparent union. I just used the word union four times in each of those. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's about the kind of union that we want. And I think, uh, again, it's really important to sort of uh, help people come to that frame in terms of what we're talking about. And with that union comes a particular analysis of power uh, and what's happening, uh, to, you know, to the point that this is about us versus them. Um, I, I, I think to, to answer the question, I think that's the key component uh, to uh, have people not miss the nuance is to be clear about where we stand uh, in this, even though we will be accused as dissidents of being anti-union. You have to just yeah. shake that off. Yeah, and the flip side of it is, you know, uh, I, I think there's many in the union establishments who would uh, like us to not criticize them because of this fear. Um, but the end result would be a weaker uh, labor movement. So you can take the uh, recent, uh, you know, a, a, a vote in the in the UAW, uh, where you know reformers were trying to support the effort for a one person one vote uh, for national leadership, and they a lot of these uh, uh, accusations were leveled against them, and all they were trying to do was. Uh, um, you know, I think they were able to cut past that and, and organize successfully to, to win the vote. Yeah, and it, it goes back to your points about it being on the shop floor. I mean, that's where, that is where we transform the union is in the fights that we take up and in how we take up those fights. That's where the transformation lives, not, in the, not at board meetings, <laughs> uh, it, sometimes not even at, in elections. Uh, some of the strongest caucuses I know the Working Educators Caucus in Philadelphia has not been able to win an election, but they've been able to move the PFT in remarkable ways uh, because they take up fights that matter to the members. Um, so we've got a, another uh, question here that I think is really important uh, relative to the question is what kinds of connections should be made with community groups uh, Given the limits of labor liberalism, I think there's a lot in that question uh, in terms of sort of uh, how in social justice unionism, to use that phrase, you know, the idea of connecting to the community is so important, building power within the community, supporting community efforts. How does that connect to the issue then of workplace struggles? No, I, 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 in critiquing labor liberalism uh, and sort of the limits, I, th I don't think we can ignore the, the sort of positives, right? And I, I like to think of it as um, all class struggle unionists are social unionists, but not all social unionists are class struggle unionists. Uh, meaning that, you know, I think we should historically and, and today, I think the class struggle unionists see our fights as part of a bigger fight between the working class and the employing class. Um, and in that, and we see community groups and everyone else who's fighting and organizers that are allies, not as our enemies, as opposed to often business unionism, which you know views them as competitors for resources and so forth. So, so I think a broad sort of class approach is, is essential to class struggle unionism. We can't, we can't really have it if we, if we don't, don't have that. Um, but, but I think, you know, it's, it's a question of how, how do we think about our struggles and, um, you, you know, I, mean, I, I know I'm probably a, a minority on this question, but like when I think about bargaining for the common good and that's being pushed a lot, I, I think it's, I, I think it's a good framework o overall. But if it's not based on, you know, sort of demands coming out of the workplace and tying them into broader demands, then what I've seen a lot of it, if you go on the website and some of the websites and look at it, it's, you know, some union staffers or someone sitting around and, and tacking on to the union demands like another, like a broader demand, like, oh, we're for green jobs or this or that. 
and is it really tied into it? Um, I think the better sort of approach, which is related, but like the Chicago teachers, you know, our students' learning conditions are our working conditions. And I think that legitimately ties in the sort of workplace-based demands with the broader class demands. If you start going, you know, too far afield, you know, maybe you can get some PR about it, but is it really emanating from the workplace and the workers and is it really tying in? And I think there's a lot of issues that we can do that. Um, but I think sometimes when, when, when it becomes just a little bit of a canned formula, I, I think it's different than a sort of, you know, and, and none of it's new, but like the public employee, you know, sort of social unionism that developed in the 80s and beyond, I think really, it, you know, really kind of tried to tie in, you know, the workplace issues with the community issues. Yeah, I, I think that's a, it's an important question and an important point that you've made. Um, one of the things that uh, we notice in our, in our workshops, all different kinds of workshops uh, within Labor Notes, uh, often when I'm working like with a, a group of workers at a particular work site or in a particular union, um, is that they very quickly want to talk about going to the community mm -hmm. before they've actually talked to the people at their work site. Uh, and and it, it always leads me to think about um, that one of the challenges of, of union work is that we are, we are together because we are workers at a, at a work site. That's what binds us. What binds us is that we're being exploited and oppressed we do the same work, we show up in the same place every day. Um, and I, I, I often find myself saying in workshops, like you, when you go to the community and you, and you say, we're gonna have a meeting about abolish the police, you know that whoever's showing up at that meeting wants to abolish the police. If you wanna talk to your coworkers about the role of the police, you've gotta be ready to talk to people who aren't with you. Uh, and and it and it it always reveals for me uh, the hard work of what it means to talk to each other as workers and to bring workers together to talk to each other about the issues that they care about. Uh, in part because I see I see people run away from that to say let's go out into the community, which can seem can feel like a safer place in terms of. Now I, I think it mostly turns out that it's not true that when we actually do talk to our coworkers. We find that we have all kinds of things in common that we didn't know, but there's there's anxiety about taking that step that can be different than going out into the community can sometimes feel safer. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's 100 percent. Look, at, um, I, I, I think, I, I, you know, I've noticed over the years that the you know, the further you are away from the workplace, the more progressive uh, the positions the uh, union officials are willing to take, you know, so at a national convention, you can take whatever position, but it's a lot harder, you know, if you're a nurses union or someone else, you can fight for green jobs, but you know, the hard work is, you know, the mine workers, you know, them going having the difficult conversations and so forth. Um, I, I, I do believe that, um, you know, there's there, there's been a lot of topic about, you know, community unionism and so forth. But, you know, in my experience, when, when you actually do go out on strike or you're, you know, getting a strike support committee, uh, you know, the workers are the community and they are tied into the community. And there's always somebody who knows their cousins in a church and this and that, and they got food coming and stuff, you know, so, 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 so I do think it, uh, it, it is essential. But I think that like, going to your point, you know, having the, the the workers involved in the strike also are, can and are part of the community and can build those ties probably a lot better than some staffers who often just end up being like, okay, let's get a nonprofit to come. They're not the community. The community is the community. Yeah, the community is the community, and it it uh, this conversation makes me think about how uh, successful. Uh, Capital has been in in keeping us from understanding, like even in the work site, who our siblings are, uh, and and the incredibly important role that unions have in helping us see each other uh, and know each other as as people who share the same fate. Uh, that when you talk about one to ones, and you think about how anxious 
workers can be about reaching out to each other. That that's how deeply uh, a kind of individualism and division has infiltrated our experience of ourselves. Uh, and what we what, when we organize what we offer is a, it, it, an experience that is uh, the antithesis of what we've been told is possible. Anyway, it's my little philosophical bent there. Uh, so we've got a question here. Um, be interested if, if you agree with this premise of the question or not, Joe. We can point to radicals of various affiliations leading big heroic fights of the past. Many recent strike actions seem often led by unaffiliated, discontented. Do radicals still have a role to play? No, I, I think radicals have a, an absolutely key role to play. And, I, you know, I think part of this is, um, it, you know, kind of gets into the question that, that I talk about a bit, but like, what do we view our role as organizers? Uh, you know, I, I, I think in the last decade or so, there was this idea that, you know, that that we needed to go out and organize the working class and that we were, you know, sort of skilled organizers, at least a, a section of, uh, of folks, uh, uh, you know, I think kind of propagated and, and believe this, that that's really kind of our role to go do it. Let's go out and organize the workers and the workers need to be organized and we need the techniques to do it and, and so forth, which all of which, you know, yeah, everyone needs techniques. Um, but I think historically the, the class struggle unionists more viewed themselves as the agitators and more the the uh, I think uh, Foster talks about about the leaven you know in terms of the militant minority being kind of the yeast or the you know kind of the one that's going to activate elements you know um, so I, I I think clearly uh, for me um, maybe part of it's I I'm a I've, I've been bargaining for 20 25 years you know so for me the the struggle comes from bargaining like it, it's not it doesn't come from just organizing it comes from getting together putting a set of demands on employers and and pushing it and then the organizing is how you, how you help make it happen but the core of it is you know putting demands on employers and doing that so i i, I do think that yeah we've had um you know strikes going on uh, in various uh, lo locations um, I, I think that the, the sort of strike wave shows that, you know, it's not just the, 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 you know, sort of organizers who made them happen, you know, workers are fighting it down. But on the other hand, you know, in, in some of these struggles, um, you know, a, a, a small number of class struggle unionists sort of situated in these struggles can make a huge difference. So look at the Washington State Carpenters, where you know, the, the, you know, some sort of class struggle unionist form, the Peter McGuire um, uh, group within the Carpenters Union out there. And that Peter McGuire was one of the founders of the Carpenters. He was a socialist in the early 1800s. Um, I think later became a business, more of a business unionist, but nonetheless. So, so, so they ended up like voting down the contract and leading a contract rejection. They voted it down four times. They finally go out on strike. They pushed to expand the picket lines because the carpenters had a labor management cooperation sort of approach where they didn't really want to raise wages because they'd lose market share in their vision. You know, that's their limited vision. Um, then, you know, then the vote finally passes on the fifth time, and, but it find out that um, they had been rigging the vote. You know, so so I think that that's an example of like a small number of people who are sort of class conscious and militant, you, you know, being able to help build these struggles and intensify them. And and I think we very much need radicals in a position to do that and expand them. And, and and I think we saw that in the 1970s, not to go off on a tangent, but, you know, there there really was a rank and file rebellion in the 1970s. And I think these sort of class struggle students and anti-war activists and, you know, civil rights activists who entered the workplaces, they helped play a key role in that. And, and, and it was a very important part of history and it was a different path for the labor movement. Awesome. Um, just a real short question here from someone um, other than the UE have other unions invited Joe to speak to their members there's a lot packed into that question too yeah well I mean just on the 
look at this is my third book you know so i i you know i wrote um reviving the strike and i think that got like a lot of attention in the labor movement and i spoke to many unions i've spoken at the ilwu conferences um teachers you know i, I i've you know, I certainly went around a lot and, and talked to different folks and and reviving the strike, you know, was not, not to go into a whole different book talk, but 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 it really was kind of based on class struggle ideas. I don't think I was ex, as explicit about it, but it was a call to say we need the strike. We need militancy, all that. I think I called out I called them labor pragmatists back then. Um, so it had a lot of the same themes and I think it 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 it, it helped to, you, you, you know, popularize these ideas about the need to revive the strike. Um, you know, th this is a, a little bit different book, but I certainly have, uh, you know, received, uh, you know, blurbs and endorsements from a, a, a variety of folks. And I, and I hope to go out and speak to a, as many trade unionists as I do, because I'm not writing this as like a you know, it's not like a leftist sort of book. That's not the intent. The jargon is, I, I try not to use jargon, you know, much and try and explain stuff. This is written for workers and unions who want to fight. And I'll, I'll just say, we'll be reading your book in the MTA and our uh, reading group, and I'll be inviting you to that as oh, well. Great. I think it's a great, I, I really think it's a good book to get workers talking to each other about how we do union work and and why we why we do it. One last question, which is actually like, I wish you posted it earlier because I think it's a really important question. Union busting tactics are hostile and often involve threats from law enforcement agencies. Uh, taking this into account, what exactly do we mean by militant labor organizing and breaking labor laws? And I, I part of why I think that's an important question, Ed, um, is that it, you know the what what we're discussing really is about, as you say, like we're we're it's about taking on capital, and um and and we know by history that capital's response is um, is violence is, is is and uh and so what do we mean by taking that on? How do we build toward that? Um, and break and and break and and I'm going bigger than the question, but even just breaking laws and the implications of that yeah so, so i have a whole chapter in my book on this um which is class struggle tactics and it's you know it's easy to say let's just go do it um but i, I think there's a lot involved um and I, you know I, I talk a bit in the book about you know sort of some of the different battles of the 1930s the difference between little steel which is the the smaller steel company still massive concerns um one of the key losses of the cio and i, I think what you find there is that employers have their narrative uh, about what the labor struggle is about and to the employer uh, the employer class when they're going to the judges and the press and so forth, um, they want to make it out like that the the workers are a violent mob, you know, trying to blockade a plant and are, are, are just engaged in law breaking and so forth. Um, you, you know, so the question is, what is a set of class struggle ideas that runs counter to that? Um, and part of that is, you know, I think class struggle unionists believe that labor creates all wealth that workers who built these plants, let's say it's an auto plant, and worked there 30, 40 years, they have more stake in that company than some absentee investors who may live, you know, across the country or the world. And we really need a set of ideas that sort of popularize it, that that validate it. So it just goes like back to the teacher struggles of the 1960s. They didn't believe they could do it. Someone had to say, no, we can strike. You know, people say, you, it's just like you said, Barbara, before people say you can't strike and you say, well, you know, what is it? You don't answer the question. You say, what, do you, what, what does it mean to be able to do that? Um, I, but I also think that w there's many lessons that we can learn about how people have been able to confront this, right? Um, one of the key things we have to do is how do we confront, uh, frankly, a reason a lot of unions won't break the law is because they have huge treasuries, right? And they have staff have pensions and they have buildings and and employers are able to go to court and basically threaten the staff that they'll bust the union. 
and the staff have legitimate concern and not just staff union members about the entire institution and you know i know this in the airline industry where it's you know very common for you know when when anytime like the group of workers gets together and does like a slowdown they go to court and seek millions of damages from the unions so 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 how do we deal with that what sort of unions would we have to create or institutions would we have to create that weren't concerned about losing their treasury that's a, a question rather than saying like Stephen Lerner who's a SEIU type from 20 years ago, you know, said, you know, we can keep our buildings and our treasuries, um, but we won't have a labor movement anymore. So, so, so that's one thing we have to confront. Another thing we have to do is, okay, what have people done? I talked before about our greatest tool is solidarity. Employers want to keep our disputes as narrow as possible. Like in this recent strike wave, employers routinely went into court and got injunctions. They limited the number of pickets to like four. Um, there was a judge in Tennessee at the, I forget which strike it was, which said you couldn't have any pickets, right? You know, so I, we can follow the law. You know, we certainly can do it and we've been doing it for 20 years, but what's the result? Um, they're able to hire scabs to replace the striking workers in almost every situation there's a little temporary blip now where it's a little more difficult which is why we've seen some more strikes but ultimately um you know what are the tactics what would it take to be able to do mass picketing what sort of community support would we need what sort of labor movement would we need what sort of ties to other unions uh, not to go back just because I read it, but the Tony Mazaki book. I mean, they went before work every day and fought on picket lines. That's how he built like a militant union in the 50s, you know, because that's what they did back then. So so I think that there's a lot in that question. I, I think it's an excellent question. Um, and, but I think if we don't start talking in this direction, we're going to be, I may not be, well, not to be too old, <laughs> but you know what I mean? The, the, another generation is going to go through the labor movement and try and recycle idea after idea. But if we cannot impede the production process, you know, in the private sector, if we cannot do that somehow, then we cannot win strikes. Good way to end. <laughs> We're gonna stop there. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you all for your questions and your participation and um, take good care, solidarity, stay strong. Right. Thank you so much. It's been a great conversation.